Hello there, I'm Black Bright, broadcasting out the UK. Welcome to my channel. First time you're passing through, please like, share and subscribe. And for my existing subscribers, thank you for your support. Today I wanted to talk about the flu vaccine because you know we're approaching October and everywhere you look, they're encouraging us to get the flu vaccine. Now, it's very interesting because um, they reckon a lot of people are not taking it up. A lot of people are a bit wary about the flu vaccine. And when you think about all the promotion about it's supposed to be so, we're supposed to protect us from, our, um, from illness, from death. There are certain um, sectors that it's, for, it's compulsory for them to have it, like education service, um, health service, um, healthcare, education. Yeah, most people that deal with vulnerable people, you know, people in care homes, hospitals. If you're in a hospital, you don't even have a say, really. They'll cajole you into having that flu jab. And there are a few exceptions if you're allergic to eggs or if you have any other allergic reaction to it, then they'll say, OK, you, sh you don't have to have it. But, you know, a lot of people, they are wary about these vaccines and especially black people who they reckon vaccines don't work when you've got melanin. I don't know how, that, how true that is, but that is what they're saying, that if you've got melanin in your skin, these vaccines don't work. So why are they encouraging <coughs> us to take them? So you have to ask yourself, or some a tickle in my throat. You have to ask yourself, um, what is the benefit? Do you have the flu? Have you been taking the vaccine every year? If you have been taking it, has it prevented you from getting the flu? If you haven't been taking it, have you been getting the flu? And I think it's an individual choice. I don't think it should be rammed down your throat. And they're kind of having all these kind of campaigns where you, um, for every shot or for every vaccine that you have, um, they give a vaccine to somebody in Africa or something, or they donate a vaccine to UNICEF and they have, you know, the vaccines are broken into polio, tetanus and those kind of things. And so, you know, it's kind of, you're kind of not really put on a guilt trip, but you're, it's almost like you're um, doing a good cause. You have a, the fact that you're having a flu shot, you're giving a flu shot to somebody else. But how do you know whether or not they want a flu shot in those countries? And the thing is, is that when you think about the history of vaccines, not so much for white people, but for black people, you know, you can't help being worried and concerned. And a lot of people, because of that Tuskegee, that Tuskegee um, experiment, where they injected a lot of black people and poor people and, well, just people of colour, really, who were poor and, you know, uneducated, and they injected them with vaccines. They didn't even know what was in the vaccine. So you get people who are really, really concerned about the motives behind the flu vaccine and why they're pushing it so hard. Surely you should have a choice. And yet it's almost as though it's mandatory. You get doctors and sur you get the surgeries calling you up. Have you had it? You get your work place asking you have you had it the schools are um, saying to you, you've got to have it and what is the big deal why are we being almost forced to have this vaccine because that's what it seems like and the thing is is that you know there's no proof that it's effective and apart from the 1918 epidemic, when, you know, 50 million, I think, were killed. I mean, but that's 1918. That's centuries ago. So I don't know why they refer to that when they're talking about today. I'm not telling people to have it or not to have it. That's not why I'm here. Why I'm The, the reason why I'm saying it to, is because any time there is something that's being pushed, I'm wary about. And apparently Bill Gates and his wife have got this um, foundation and they're pushing for this um, flu. What's it called? A flu. 
Bill and Melinda, Melinda Gates Foundation, who have shares in pharmaceutical companies, have launched their Universal Influential Vaccine Development Grant Challenge. I mean, they have got billions and millions in the pharmaceutical country, companies and industry. They've got shares. They sold all their Microsoft shares and invested it in the pharmaceutical countries, in the companies or industry or whatever you want to call it. So why would, you know, what is their big interest? So when you get rich people pushing the... I'm going to cough again, pushing us little lowly people into having vaccines. You know, you have to question, why is that? And I don't, I don't like the idea of it being forced down my throat. If it wasn't everywhere, if people weren't calling you, and if it wasn't everywhere you looked, doctor surgery, shops and everything, then I wouldn't think twice about it. But it's almost like... It's constantly, um, it's constant, you know, like it's almost like they're trying to force it into your brain that you've got to have it. And my mother is 92. She doesn't want to have it. And she doesn't have it every year. And apparently the doctor came round to her house because she's um, disabled and said to her, oh, um, they came round with the flu kit. And she said, look, I haven't given you permission. I don't want the flu. I don't want the flu jab. And they had to take it away and they came back. But they keep on persisting. And I mean, if my mother wasn't a strong woman, they'd force her to have it. And at that age, 92, why would you force a 92-year-old and all these other elderly people to have flu vaccines? especially if they're living otherwise normal, healthy lives. If they're in hospital and they're confined and they're not well, well and there's viruses around, then I can understand, I can see the logic of that. But if you're at home and you're living quite a healthy and normal life, I don't see no point in trying to force the, the flu vaccine down your throat. Um, anyway... That's my little two pence worth. Um, flu vaccines are marketed as protecting us, our families, our patients against flu. There are also campaigns that we that will offer organisations like UNICEF and third world countries a free vaccine for every vaccine an individual has from a first world country. These vaccines are broken down to help fight against measles, tetanus, polio around the world. Uh, seasonal influenza epidemics have caused 3 million to 5 million severe cases and 300,000 to 500,000 deaths globally each year, according to the World Health Organization. You know, I'm sure if that was the case, we'd have more news, don't you think? There'd be more news about it because that's a hell of a lot of people. That's like an epidemic, isn't it? So why don't we hear more about all these have 500,000 deaths every year all over the world. Only when it comes around to a flu time do we hear this. According to the Centre of Diseases and Control and Prevention, CDC, influenza killed almost 80,000 people in the United States during 19, 2017 and 2018 season. There were 49 million cases and 960,000 hospital hospitalizations. I mean, unless I'm going around with my eyes covered up and my ears blocked, I, I, I haven't heard anything. And that's a hell of a lot, isn't it? The majority of the 185 children who died from the flu last year did not receive a flu vaccine. And infectious disease specialist Alison Bartlett, MD, an associate professor of pediatrics of U Chicago Medicine, studies have shown that flu vaccination cuts the risk of flu associated death by half in children. Well, I'm not a specialist, so I can't comment. I can't comment on that at all. The Centre for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, recommends flu shots every season for everyone older than six months of age. 
There are a few exceptions, people who have had a severe aller allergic reaction to the flu vaccine shouldn't get one. <clears throat> people who have an egg allergy should get, should get the vaccine, but in a medical setting. But I heard that people over 60 or 65 didn't need the vaccine. And now they came out with a Vic vaccine last year, I believe, for over 65s. What's that about? You know, it's kind of scary because you think when you're over a certain age, your immune system can be lower and they're putting all these foreign bodies and bacteria into your body and you're supposed to fight against it. They don't know which bacteria they're supposed to be fighting. They don't know what viruses they're supposed to be fighting. And yet, so they find these random viruses and they put them all in a bottle about six months ahead of time. By that time, whatever viruses or flu viruses are in your body, they've changed. They've changed that, you know, apparently they've changed into something else. So by the time you get the vaccine in October, you know, they're fighting outdated viruses. So I don't understand what the hype is. Maybe we're just supposed to be guinea pigs for, for, the, for the flu vaccine to see if it works or if it doesn't work, to see how many people get flu and how many people don't get flu. See how many people who have the flu vaccine go ill and who don't. Maybe it's just about that because, you know, these pharmaceutical countries, companies, that is what they're interested in. And they have all the patents for all of the antidotes. Some people get the flu shot and still get influenza, even though vaccination may not be completely, even though vaccination may not completely prevent the flu, the symptoms tend to be less severe in people who have been vaccinated, said Bartlett. Well, that's questionable. That is questionable. I remember I didn't have the flu shot no, did I have? Yeah, I used to have the flu shot every single year. And then one year I thought, nah, I'm not going to have it. And I was fine. So the next year I thought, nah, I'm not going to have it. I was fine. And then I think a third year, I think at work they kept on saying, oh, you've got to have it, you've got to have it, blah, 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 blah. So I went and had it and I was as sick as a dog for about six weeks, sick as a dog. And I said to myself, I'm not having it anymore. But that's just me. I'm not saying a lot of people have it and it doesn't affect them. But I don't know. The 1918-1919 flu pandemic apparently killed an estimated 50 million people worldwide. People would develop the flu, then secondary bacterial infections. They progressed to pneumonia and then a combination of the influenza virus plus respiratory bacteria killed most of the victims. There were also no vaccines at the time to protect against the flu virus, no antiviral drugs to combat influenza and no effective antibiotics to counter secondary bacterial infections as there are now. <clears throat> During wartime there will always be malnourishment, poor hygiene, overcrowded mental medical camps and hospitals, which is a fodder for bacterial infections. There's a claim that the 1918 virus came from avian source. Birds transmitted it to humans and the virus adapted, learning how to spread from person to person. The virus behind the 1918 epidemic turned out to be extremely lethal. Even a low dose multiplied quickly, killing exposed laboratory mice within three days. The thing is, these people are dead. How do we know you know, the source of the virus. How do we know it's from birds? You know, we just don't know. We take so much from history books. And as we know, history books, half of them are made up. Half of them are conjecture. You have, you know, there's so many, there's so much misinformation and omissions. You can't even believe. Even the Bible, they've changed it. Goodness knows how many times. If they can change the Bible, if they can change the history books, if they can change our history. And I mean, when they were giving those people that, um, the least, you know, that um, injecting them with the um, syphilis virus, they didn't tell them. That was all done deceitfully. They got found out. So, 
you know, when you have a history of deceit and lies, how do you know what's the truth? How do you know what is really behind the flu vaccine? I'm not saying it's it, there's anything wrong with it or right of it, but how do you know the truth behind it when you've got all these money people trying to promote it and ram it down your throat every five minutes? I mean, we're September now, October, you watch. It's going to be everywhere. Those who claim, okay, I've said that. The Rich Bill Melinda Gates Foundation, who have shares in pharmaceutical companies, have launched the, the Universal Influenza Vaccine Development Grand Challenge. The goal is to identify transformative concepts that will lead to development of universal influenza vaccines better preparing the world for the next influenza pandemic that's what i'm saying it's all developmental it, they're all bloody scapegoats you know that's why they want us to have the vaccine to see how they it can be improved if anything but meanwhile if it does go wrong if it's not capturing it can't capture all the viruses it is rumored that non-consensual practices have been carried on Africans under the guise of development and it is not surprising that the big pharma industry is the most profitable on the planet. They reckon that not everyone is rushing for the flu vaccine but what do they expect when people have been governed by deceit for centuries? Why would any black person volunteer for the flu vaccine which historically does not work on those with melanin so it can't prevent the virus? In certain situations, the flu shot is compulsory. Staff who work in education, those confined in care homes, working with children and other institutions, parents, healthcare staff, social workers, and they all have to do that under the guise of protecting the vulnerable. I personally, I wish I could trust the system a bit more rather than be reminded of our dark history and the Tuskegee experiment and the pharmaceutical conspiracy every time it's flu shot time. According to Alternative Politics News, I'll put the link in the description, and this is verbatim. Now, I'm not going to get into all the conspiracy theories about the fact that he, we're talking about Bill Gates, is part of a global population reduction scheme. But I think that it is not too far-fetched to say that there has been a systematic and historical tendency of using the less developed continents, especially Africa, for non-consensual research in the pioneering of new money-making techniques disguised as development, and that Bill Gates could be part of it. After all, the big pharma industry is one of the most profitable on the planet, and it strongly relies on the enforcement of patents and intellectual rights, for which Bill Gates is notorious due to his work to in Microsoft. The African continent has been that which has been most severely affected by the strict provisions of patent rights enforced by transnational corporations with the aid of the IMF, oblique World Bank, oblique World Trade Organization cartel. There is also a huge body of documented evidence that the pharmaceutical industries have for a long time and repeatedly used um, vulnerable populations both in the development and developing world as guinea pigs for the development of new drugs and pharmaceuticals. <clears throat> Experiment, okay, this is not just isolated to big pharma by the way, it applies to nearly every sector of the industrial capitalist economy which by definition is based on exploitation of an underclass. According to Security Exchange Commission records, Bill has sold 90 million shares in the past year and at the moment he holds 591 million shares, which equals around 7% of 8.4 billion in total. I'm not quite sure of the, um, the time that this was written, to be honest. Like I said, I took it from Alternative Politics News and I'm going to put the link, but I didn't really take the date and he continues to be the largest single stockholder of the big pharma of the of the company for the time being 
He is, of course, investing in a wide variety, a wide variety of firms such as retail, Walmart, food and beverages, Coca-Cola and McDonald's, energy and transportation, British Petroleum and Toyota, and biotech, which is Nimbus Discovery and Foundation Medicine. But none of those investments match the ones he has made in the pharmaceutical industry. As a matter of fact, one of the first acts he did after withdrawing his shares from Microsoft after stepping down was to invest the British pharmaceutical giant GlaxoSmithKline. On September the 9th, 2002, Gates sold almost half a billion worth of Microsoft stock and begun investing heavily in Big Pharma. In the second half of 2002, he bought 2.5 million shares in Eli Lilly, manufacturer of Prozac, and also made major investments in Merck and Pfizer. <clears throat> On the 17th of May 2002, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation purchased shares in nine big pharmaceutical companies valued at nearly 205 million. Here is when we begin to see a shift of his personal investments in Big Pharma to those of the foundation. This was an important step in convincing people to donate their own personal fortunes, a sort of led by example, to fool the rich people in need of their conscience being stroked or simply have their image restored or improved. So... It's all never as straightforward as it looks. And I, yeah, I got that from, I will put the links in where I got that information that I read. And yeah, that's all for now. So, you know, if you've had the flu shot every year and it doesn't bother you, that's fine, you know. But I'm just saying why some people are hesitant because they were saying some people, there's not so many people taking it up anymore, you know, going for it anymore. And I just wanted to share some of the reasons why that might be. Okay. And that's all for now. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.